Good afternoon and welcome to The Crucible. It's wonderful to see you all here. I hope you're having a wonderful festival. My name is Liz McIntyre and I'm the festival director. It's my pleasure to introduce the host of this afternoon's very, very special talk, BBC controller of channels and iPlayer, Charlotte Moore, who will be in conversation with documentary giant, Sir David Attenborough. It's my honor to bring to the stage Charlotte and Sir David. David, I have to hang out with you more often. <laughs> if that is the welcome that you get, um, that is amazing. Sheffield isn't usually quite so lively by this day. In the, uh, there's been some long nights, I'm, I'm quite sure of it, but uh, that is amazing. Um, and welcome, David. Uh, I know I'm absolutely thrilled to be doing this, but I know for everyone here, this will feel like a real highlight and treat of the festival. Um, it's been a busy year. Um, which I know, I think probably someone says that to you every year. <laughs> I realise that, but I know this has been a very busy year. And I, when I think about it, I think, you know, it's almost 65 years in broadcasting. You must have met, well, you must have been the man that has met more extraordinary creatures, I reckon, than anyone else on the planet. Um, whether that's mountain gorillas, whether that's Komodo dragons, whether that's telling us all about the Darwin frog. And when I think of all the things that you've done, um, and I think 65 years, that must be, well, nearly 65 years, that must be a record. And yet you're still, you're still motoring on and doing the most extraordinary work. And as I say, this year has been a really busy year as well. Um, but through all that, I think you've engendered a love of the natural world with all of us, whether that's filmmakers you've inspired. I know many of people here will feel like that. I certainly do. Um, whether that's audiences that you've brought the natural world to the screens and into their lives, and I think that's an extraordinary thing. Um, and some of those moments that you've had in your career, uh, I think, must signal probably one of the best TV careers uh, that any of us could ever hope to have. So before we start chatting, because I know we'll find it hard to stop, um, I thought, let's just play uh, the first VT of some of the most amazing moments. I, I know it wasn't easy for anyone putting that together because it could have gone on. But um, it makes me think, David, where did it all start? Was it, was it a question of natural selection? Was it, were you destined to be the man that did all of that? Well, I suppose uh, I I'm almost must have some kind of record that I got a job in television without ever having seen television. <laughs> I mean, it didn't exist, really. Yeah. But it's not, not, not quite true. I'd seen one programme uh, that my future father-in-law had on his, in his house. And that was it? And that was a play. That and that was, was all. And, I, and uh, in 1952, you know, the B BBC was the only broadcasting organisation broadcasting television in Europe. Uh, and it all came from up in North London, uh, Alexander Palace, just two studios, neither of them anywhere near as big as this. Uh, and we'd, we'd, a service was run from then. Uh, and I didn't, I'd never seen television. I, I was working in publishing, uh, doing a very, very boring job as a science editor. Of a, but it, it sounded grand, but it was actually sort of putting in commas on a bad day, crossing them out. Well, I mean, not, not, no good at all. And I saw, applied for, for sound radio. I got turned down flat. I didn't get an interview or anything. Um, and then about a fortnight later, I got a letter saying, we've got this new thing. Could we persuade you to join? And that's where it all and, started. And it's called television, and uh, we could tell you about it. Would you like to come and chat? Which I did. <laughs> Yeah. If only life was so easy. I, I know. Unbelievable. But, and I said, yes, I thought I might as well. Why not? <laughs> but then when did you manage? Because like, television was one thing, but no one was really making natural history programs then. No, because all television was live. Television uh, in 1952 was paid for by the licence payment, by a sound radio licence. 
Um, and so every penny we have, not almost, right, there were about made 10,000 viewers or something. That's all, as against 10 million, as there soon would be. Um, and um, uh, we had these two studios, and they weren't even really allowed any film because the people that it was paid for by the sound license and the, and the people in the sound radio in, in, down in London, in Portland Place, uh, when you went and said, we would like a bit more money to do this, that, and the other, and they said, no, you've got your electronic things up there, your little toys, you play with those, and you don't bother us. Um, and so it was all live. Um, and, uh, and the only natural history programmes were animals that were brought in from the London Zoo in the middle of the night and dumped on a table like this with a, with a bit of coconut matting on it, and then they had to perform. It was quite good, because at least, you know, you, there's always a chance it would bite the chap who was holding it, <laughs> or indeed pee which down his you. front, yeah. which was also entertaining, or escape. So you watch. good live telly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But it wasn't natural history, and I was, I was as a biologist, I, I wanted to do programmes which made you understand about the way the animals work, and for that we needed film. And that's when I realised actually ZooQuest was incredibly pioneering of its time, wasn't it? The yeah. fact it was shot on film. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and indeed it was on 60mm film, mm -hmm. um, and since this is a documentary festival, festival I mean, uh, up to that moment, <clears throat> the electronic telecine machine, which showed the film, um, were not very, very good. I mean, they were, they were in their early period, early stages, but they couldn't get a, a, a decent image from a 60 millimeter. That was regarded as amateur. They used 35, the, yeah. the film stock that used as cinema. Uh, and when I said I wanted to go uh, to Africa and I would have to use 60 mil, the BBC, head of film, said, over my dead body. And, and I argued about it, and eventually um, I was allowed to take 60 mil, but, but he was dead against it. And I, I, in, in fact, in order to get his own way, his own back, as it were, to show how, and show me how ignorant I was about film, mm. he said, if you are going to shoot it on, uh, on 16 millimeter on this ridiculous stuff, in order to get the, the quality that we real, you'll have to shoot it on color negative, you know? Uh, and I, I don't know really what it meant. But anyway, it was... It, <laughs> It was, thought, a color, it, it, it was a color, and yeah. then you will take a black and white print yeah. from the color negative, um, and, uh, and and that will be better than if you stop on black and white negative. And for that reason, there was this color stock. Well, shall we show that clip? Because I think this has an extraordinary story, wasn't it? It was only a few months ago when we were thinking about what we were going to put on for and which zoo quest. Am I right in saying the Bristol archivist said, well, I've just found ZooQuest in colour? Not only that, but someone, one of your producers, rang mm. up and said, you've got this colour negative uh, that you've shot on ZooQuest. And I said, impossible, old boy, because we shot it all in black and white. I'd totally forgotten <laughs> the yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. The story that I've just told you. Yeah. And, and I said, we might have shot a couple of reels as tests, but there was nothing else. Impossible. I and know then, about yeah, technology. That's right. Yeah. And then you produced all this stuff, which I must say I found quite beguiling. It's, it's quite extraordinary, isn't yeah, it? Because, I mean, I've seen a lot of ZooQuest in black and white. Too. And it's got a very different... It makes it feel yeah. very recent, yeah. doesn't it? Should we, let's show this clip. Okay. It's a fantastic clip on so many levels. I should explain that we don't do things like that anymore. <laughs> and quite right, too. <laughs> But back in 1954, that was the way zoos collected their animals. Mm. And we were there <laughs> to film, actually, the way London Zoo was collecting that antique, which we brought back and, and fed on. I mean, I watch it just thinking, thank God that wasn't in a studio live. Yes. That would have been... <laughs> that would have been very tricky. But um, that was really uh, the birth of you as a presenter as well, wasn't it? In, yes. in terms of the, the, um, the wildlife, because you weren't going to be the presenter in the news. No, my, I regarded my job as a producer and as a studio director. Mm. It was all like the business of live cameras and saying, you know, cut to three, coming to four, coming in a pan in one, all that stuff which gave you a sort of megalomaniac view of, uh, of life. It's very exciting. Well, you, you corrected live television? Not live, no. No, I well, I did. Well, that no. was then, then. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> what, what then happened was that Jack, who was Jack Lester, who was the keeper of the London Zoo's uh, reptile house, became very ill. And because there was um, a studio component in this series, mm. in the program, somebody had to take his place. It was Jack was explaining what these animals were with showing them in the studio. 
And the head of television said, uh, when Jack was taken off to hospital, poor man, Attenborough, you're the only people, uh, the only person who was there at the time who mm. could do it, so you go and do it and we'll get someone else to direct the cameras, mm. which is why I appeared on television, and that's the only reason why I did. And then you went off to Madagascar, to Indonesia, to... I mean, had you been to any of these places before? No, no, no. it was absolutely bonkers, actually. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I imagine... Well, you're the, you're the boss now, but I mean, if someone comes up to you and says, a 28-year-old, 27-year-old, mm. and say, I'd like to go to... Uh, to um, uh, Indonesia, so it's a bit out there. And, and you'd say, uh, he said to me, he said, really, what do you want to go? And I said, well, I, there's a big lizard there called dragons. And said, oh, yes, right, oh. Um, how, long would you, how long would you be away? And I said, well, you know, expert, the fare's very expensive, comparatively speaking. So uh, I think we'll probably be away for three months. Right, oh, and, and how many programmes? And I said, well, I thought six, 30 minutes, nine, four, six. I mean, I said, yes, that'd be fine. Well, you'd be back. And I said, but just before Christmas, I want to see the children. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, I know. And there you go. So that's, that's how I hope you're commissioning I'm things commissioning these days. I'm commissioning just like that. I'm <laughs> free and easy. I'm like, go for it. Well, I have to say, some of our natural history guys, they literally do spend months. Oh, no, them. now they, they spend a long they time. They do, they but not running time. around chasing. No, 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 I mean, most of the time, feeding parrots. <laughs> yes, I, no, I mean, what an amazing job. It was one of those times, wasn't it, that you were, I think you were on your way to Madagascar, and you got the call from uh, Joy and yeah. George Adamson. We landed in Nairobi, and they said, there's a, a telegram for you, uh, because in those days, paper mm. things you've got. And it said, we have just heard a, a lioness uh, that, uh, in northern Kenya, who was brought in, who was bought, uh, suckled by a, a game warden, and she has gone to the wild, mated, and brought back the cubs to show to the husband and wife who had reared her. And that was Elsa the lioness. And the book was just going to be come out, and they said, nip up and go and see her. So with no, no preparation and no um, uh, knowledge or research or anything, we just, Charles Lagos, who was the cameraman, 16 mil cameraman, he and I, we delayed our trip to Madagascar, went off to northern Kenya and see Elsa. And that was the first time people hadn't really heard about Elsa. So they this hadn't. was, so this no. was, should we show that yeah. clip? Because I think it's a very special moment that you witnessed there. For the technically minded, I should explain that there was no, no way of linking a sound recorder to a camera in, at that time. So what you heard, those certain sounds of, of Joy Adamson were correct, but they were wild. They were, they were recorded back in camp, mm. and so we had to put it on. Mm. The, we are, when I arrived, in fact, uh, rather unexpectedly, Joy greeted us, and I'd been flying overnight, and I was done, and so I, I opened a camp bed and went down to sleep in the next door to the river, and in her big camp, her camp, main camp, up in northern Kenya. And I was sleeping like that, and I suddenly felt a huge weight on my chest. And I opened my eyes, and there was a terrible halitosis, and there was this <laughs> peaky with uh, spittle on the fur of her under jaw, it was this lioness. Amazing. Elsa lying on top of me, <laughs> and I thought, uh, I'm not sure what to do now. <laughs> uh, and then, fortunately, I heard uh, Joy Adams saying, "Come, come, my Liebchen," you know. And Elsa came, and this, this great lioness walked away. And that was that was the beginning of my relationship with her. With Elsa. With the yeah. lioness, yes. Well, you've had relationships <laughs> with gorillas, with lionesses, yes. with yes, you know right. many sloths. Um, <laughs> Um, but it must have been, I mean, because obviously that went on to become the film we all know, Born Free. But that did change the way I think the British public thought about lions as well. Yes, um, I, I, if I was critical, uh, and, uh, and I could be, I mean, I think that the, the, you have a lot of problems which we have now with when you show a film of predators. Mm. You know, these are killers, you know. Yeah. And, and so Joy Adamson, um, the lioness had come back and the next thing that happened was that after she, they had done this great mm. welcome, uh, Joy said something, something in Swahili, no, Njapusi. Uh, and I thought, it's actually Swahili, um, and I thought she said Jinja Pussy, which I thought was a funny <laughs> way of... But, but, 
glad we got the pronunciation right there. Yeah. yeah. But what he actually said was, what it means is kill a goat, you see. So while Joy was saying, oh, my darling cat, at the back of the camp, there's horrible noise of a, cat, of a goat having its throat cut, you know, which is not nice. Yeah. And then the body, newly born, killed body, was born for Joy, to, for Elsa to toy with. So, so the question of relationships with predators mm. is, is quite complex. And that line of the danger you must have felt in at yeah. times. Oh, yeah. Or were you young enough that you didn't worry? Because there is something, isn't it? I think we get more aware. No, no, I was quite sure I wasn't going to sleep <laughs> <laughs> somewhere except when I was in, inside the Land Rover or somewhere. Yeah, I mean, mm. an extraordinary experience. And I know, I mean, I've watched quite a lot of the zoo quests and they are amazing, the places you went to. Mm. And I think in that time, actually, when nobody travelled like that, so really you were the first to go and see some of these things and visit. It was one of the bliss. Like the it was one of the bliss of doing natural history programmes overseas uh, in the 1950s, mm. was that all the animals you, you were shown, people had not seen before. They'd never been on television before. Mm. I mean, it was the first time the giant anteater mm. had been seen on television. And you could say that about 90% of the things you did. And the Komodo were, dragon. Well, and the Komodo before, dragon, you know. yeah. So, those were, so they were happy days for, I mean, because as long as you got a shot, it didn't matter how bad it was. You know, people say, <laughs> did you see that last night? You know, and that, so that was good. <laughs> so why on earth, when you were doing all of that, did you decide to go and do a desk job? Because, of course, you know, it was in 1964, wasn't it, that you yeah. agreed to take the job of the controller on BBC Two, which you and I both agree is an amazing job. But I, I look at that and I go, that was... Well, um, in 1952, um, I was, well, I was uh, 26, mm. and I had, um, until 60, it was in 65, I was asked mm. to, to go on BBC Two. And I thought, well, now what are you, Attenborough? Are you a television man or are you a scientist? You know. Mm. Uh, and I concluded I was a television man. Uh, and if you said you were in television and that's your career, not as being a professional biologist, and someone said to you, there's a, a new network, it's only been on air for 11 months and it's going to have to have a complete change of its scheduling policy. There's 12 million quid or whatever it was, mm. I can't remember. Uh, go and make some programs for it. Think up programs for it. What would you say? Yeah, too good. Too exactly. good. Exactly. Well, well, they said it exactly to you. Shall we? So we both know. So That's, we know. If you're in television, that is a dream ticket. You yeah. can't believe that anybody would be so silly, <laughs> but so jealous. <laughs> Shall we, I think that we're going to show a clip now of what BBC Two was like at that time, because it's quite hard to kind of place yourself in a... So what was the early... Well, this BBC is what we ended two? up with. Yeah, yes. I mean, in many ways, I think that goal that you set is something that we still all absolutely aspire to, that we're not here to make the other programmes that other people would make. We're here to make really different alternative programmes. But what did that mean then? What did different mean? Well, it, well you know, the, the, there was only one network, mm. and, and there were an awful lot of big subjects that nobody had tackled. Mm. Um, and I simply said, we had heads of departments that I had of sport, head of comedy, head of drama, head of light entertainment, head of music. And I, and I had conversations with every one of them and say, OK, what is it in your area in sport, let us say, uh, that you want covering? And they said, are you crazy? There's lots of stuff. Like what? Rugby league, flood rugby league. Cricket, we could do limited, uh, uh, limited overs cricket. Professional tennis, we would, all tennis, Wimbledon was mm. amateur until mm. then. Um, really? Snooker, we did all these things for new. And no other network had them. But, e but even more fundamental than that, it was extraordinary. You know, in 1954, there was no documentary series lasting more than 30 minutes. Mm. Mm. And when I said, oh, we're going we're to start 50 minute or one hour documentaries, people said, you can't, the audience won't stay there for 50 minutes for an hour for a documentary. OK, watch. You know, and we, did, we introduced all kinds of new documentary strands, um, which were hour long and so on and things like civilization, the center of man, and all that. No, I mean, we have a lot, I, we have a lot to thank you for, that those, because those seminal series really changed, I think, what the documentary on television was. But who inspired you? How did you know that 50, 60-minute documentaries were... Because some of the 30-minute documentaries were almost current affairs pieces, weren't yeah, they, actually? Yeah, so how did... What, who were you inspired by? Well, I, I mean, as people here will know, I mean, the, the great, there's a great documentary tradition in this country. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, there was a man called uh, Robert Flaherty, who, who, were on a, who did the, some of the first of the, uh, of the documentaries in exotic parts of the world. Uh, and, and so I, I knew that that sort of thing could be done. Mm. Uh, but also, we, one wanted to do documentaries uh, about British things, which were done in a free, in a free eavesdropping way. And there was a marvellous radio producer called Dennis Mitchell. That's right who did on Radio 3, or yes, who'd be on Radio 3, or maybe Radio 4, in which he, he did, um, he took the tape recorder, which had only just been invented in the 1950s, the portable tape recorder, and was, was taking conversations from people, ordinary people in the streets, and, and putting them together in say, radio features. And that was introduced into, uh, in, it turned into sound. And those were some of the earliest documentaries that were made in, in the Grierson and Flaherty tradition. And I think, we, we've got a clip from Dennis Mitchell, which I think for anyone who makes documentaries, it's amazing the similarities, I think, again, to what we aspire to do now. Yes. Let's just show the clip, because I think he really inspired you, this guy, didn't he? See, Dennis, Dennis um, you see, it's poetry, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it is, it is something more than just mm. current affairs reportage. Mm. And, and Dennis continued that tradition of the Flatian tradition and so on, into television with that sort of thing. Mm. And the Chicago thing, you couldn't show it in a clip, but there was a sequence in the abattoir in which um, the, the, the steers, the cattle, were brought in and stunned and then cut up and there are raw meat within 30 seconds and so on. Very powerful sequence. And Dennis cross-cut that with those sort of shots of, 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 me, of old men who are ruined with drink or mm. violence or whatever. Um, and of course, I mean, it was absolutely clear what sort of line the, the film was taking. Mm. Chicago, of course, was infuriated, and, and they, they, never, they never showed it on television mm. think, for, in America for about 10 years. Mm. But it, no commentary from Dennis, yeah. and it was just, just those pictures edited with a sense of timing and poignancy and poetry, which is a great documentary tradition, and which we don't have, see as much of as we might wish. It's incredibly yeah. powerful. The fact it's unmediated, it's edited, yeah. but it's not yeah. someone telling you what to think, is it? You take from it, you know, but you know the great what? American city, yeah. and there That's you right. are. It's an yeah. extraordinary uh, piece of work, yeah. I think. And that really did inspire you to kind of think, I want real voices, isn't it? I wanted to hear from... Yes. You wanted real people to be on the telly. Yes, yes. And, and Dennis, as a matter of fact, I remember very well, we had a huge argument in a, in a meeting of the documentary uh, mm. department that Den what actually Dennis had done was to take lines that he'd recorded wild of people saying real things, but playing them over people who hadn't said it, mm. which raised issues. You, mm. you wouldn't get away with that now. No, you couldn't get away with it now, no. Mm. But of course everything, because it was sync sound in the way it was poetry, wasn't it? Yes, it that was. That was the artifice at the time. Yeah. Yeah. But do you, did, you, did you think it was important, and I suppose how did this go down, um, to tackle difficult subjects? Did you feel that your new BBC Two, on two should be able to do anything. On two, yes, and, and we did, and we did. Look. And I remember, uh, well, we, we started a series, which I, I, delib I, I was getting fed up with this uh, balancing everything all the time. Um, and, I mean, of course, you have to be balanced, particularly if you're a monopoly. Mm. But, but I, wanted, I wanted voices to take an extreme line on things. Mm. Uh, that to take an unpopular line or things, and make a film to say in favour of fox hunting, which in fact we did, mm. and various other. We called it One Pair of Eyes, which was a good title, and because what we did, we found interesting people with with very firm opinions on certain subjects, and gave them a crew out with the director to allow them to make a film which had explained why they talk what they did. And of course, you, you had, had yourself for trouble. But on the other hand, if you use the title like One Pair of Eyes, then the audience knows what they're expecting, and that's fair. We've got a quick clip of One Pair of Eyes. Shall we see Good. one of those? And that... <laughs> that was Tony Richardson, the great theatre director and film director. Unabridged. Yes, he, unabridged. Yeah. He trusted yeah. you to yeah. think, I'm yeah. going to say it. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Had no qualms about it at all. 
Um, the other thing I, I was told about, which I thought we've got to get this clip in, obviously the BBC, and particularly BBC One, actually, is the place for big national moments, and whether it's the royal wedding, whether it's your uh, 90th celebrations that we've had, we feel there are these moments when we all want to watch together. Um, and, of course, you were the controller, weren't you, with the moon landings? Yes. And, and then uh, the schedule is where the test card went on at what time, saying end of the night? Quarter past 11, I think. Quarter past, past 11, 11, Britain was to mm. go to bed. Um, but you made the big decision, didn't you, to...? Yes, well, it seemed to me extraordinary. In all of humanity's history, the first time we, any human beings left this planet and, and returned um, and, and gone to another was a historic moment. Mm. And the, the great thing about television, after all, uh, was that it could be live when it wanted to be. Mm. And so, uh, and after all, you know, it's, it, it, it was quite tough because something could have gone appallingly wrong, yeah. of course, as, it's, as it did on subsequent occasions. Did you, did you discuss the possibility? And, and, um, and there you've got this live thing. And, and the, the, we had, of course, inspired people like Patrick Moore and so on who were giving the commentaries. Um, and the, the whole of the nation held its breath. Uh, while uh, would would the spaceship reappear from the other side of the moon, you know, or from the other side of the Earth, or wherever it was, and you were all waiting and, and waiting, and, and the tension of the whole nation was was extraordinary. On the other hand, I also have to add that the Americans, of course, had a backup after the, the, the Apollo one. They had an Apollo two, which go, in case something went wrong in the early stages of the film. So at least they'd go. So a fortnight later, once again they were going to send someone to the moon, mm. see? And um, in those days, we had a telephone exchange at the television center who kept a log of viewers used to ring up and tell us what they thought about things. And, um, and one chap wrote <laughs> and, um, and said, what has happened to the football? And, and, <laughs> and, 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 the, and the lady on the telephone exchange, PBX lady, who was a very stalwart lot for the BBC, was always give the BBC's, you know, they said, well, I'm very sorry, so you're sorry, Mr. the football, um, but in fact, there's a man landing on the moon. And the, the chap on the other end of the phone said, there's always somebody hanging on the moon. <laughs> 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 it's a great moment. Yeah. I mean, those people still phone up yes. and say, where's the football? Do they? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They, you get PBX few... log? Yes, yes. Oh, do you? Well, yes. And we still, you glad know, some people are very free to, to say, point out a problem with the schedule yeah. for their particular viewing. <laughs> yes. um, should we, let's just show a clip from that, because I think watching this makes you realise what a massive moment. I mean, we'd been to Everest by then, hadn't we, yeah. in the 50s? Yeah. But really going to the moon must have felt like we yeah. could go anywhere. That's right. And of course, what, what people did, they left their television sets of mm. that, and they went outside into the garden and looked up at the moon. moon. See if they could see. Well, it was one of us up there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was, had a huge impact. It did change the way we thought about our planet, yeah. didn't it? Oh, oh it absolutely, and that's the other thing. It's thing. hard for us to understand that if you were born, yeah. you know, post. And, and the, the images of the, of the Earth, that bl the blue planet, coming up for the dawn seen from the moon, uh, at which encapsulates and... and and gives an image to the soul, tiny little ball in the infinity of the universe on which there's life, which is us and everything else. And, and that image has had a huge effect on the whole of the conservation movement, which is something close to my heart. Mm. But it must have, as a controller, felt that, gosh, if I've shown the world, shown the country, that moment, yeah. you must have felt almost anything was possible. Did you grow? Did you feel you grow in confidence as BBC Two was obviously becoming this major uh, kind yeah. of oh, yes. influence? I would say. Yes. You yes. were telling and showing people things they literally couldn't have imagined. It's hard for again. We take that for granted. That, that's. No, I suppose we do. I suppose. Well, I think to to feel like the audience were actually being taken as close as is possible to yeah. that extraordinary yeah. moment. That must have felt incredibly exciting. And, it, and well, it's perfectly true that, that um, audiences now all over the world have a mental image of what the Earth is and what the Earth's contained that has never been there in the whole of history. Mm. Nobody has been able to envisage the complexity and glory of life on the little planet mm. that we live on mm. in the way that everybody can, every, rich, poor, whoever, everybody can get that image and see that image in their mind. And I'm, without that, the conservation movement, for which I am very closely bound up in, it wouldn't be as powerful as it now is. No. 
but, but people of all kinds uh, feel who've never left cities feel powerfully about the situation of uh, conservation of life on this planet. And, and television in documentaries, but also in that particular moment, has, has contributed very greatly too. And what I hadn't realised, because we'll go and talk a bit more about the conservation thing a bit later, but what I hadn't realised is how BBC Two, even then, was a very much a mixed genre channel, wasn't it? It wasn't just about the passions of documentaries and natural history, and, but actually, you, you really used your time there as a place to kind of take people to other areas as well. So there was a wonderful moment, wasn't there, when you decided you wanted to have live jazz, mm. which I, I, was a personal passion of yours, mm. David? Well, I mean, classic, classic jazz, yeah. was, yes. And, and the interesting thing was that um, uh, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, that sort of period of, 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 of music mm. in America, America had now forgotten about it, and so had largely Britain. And, and the head of Life Entertainment, came to me and said, look, you know, if we were able to offer a run of to Duke Ellington, uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, Woody Herman, um, and we could, we could finance it by getting a, a tour arranged with friends of mine in the music business who will take them on, pay them, give them a tour around Britain. So just by, by as you could do, and as you, you can do too, or just as I was doing, which is to say, okay, We'll have a series on classic jazz. We'll run six, 30 minutes, and if they're any good, we'll run another six. You know, turned on the dotted line, bang, that was that. And then you were able to do this. So it's a huge power you have. But they, well, and, uh, yes, well, I, I, must, I must have a thing. But you, of course, then brought over. Yes. Duke Ellington. Yes, I was. Louis and, Armstrong. And, I and I these people, go, two TV centres. Yeah, and they were down in the, in, uh, I'm in the television centre. My, the office was on the sixth floor, the administration where I was. But we were on top of the studios. So at about six or seven o'clock at night before you were knock, knocked off and went home, I walked down and looked at all the studios. And there they would be. There was Louis Armstrong. Hi, Dave. <laughs> <laughs>Again, these people had sort of, you know, had never come to the UK, had you? And you, they, you got them here, and then they toured around the UK, mm. and you gave them the second lease mm. of life, mm. and again, uh, brought them to the people of Britain. Mm. I mean, I think that sort of introduction, the things that you can take ple people to places on BBC Two that they didn't know they wanted to go to. But, you know, the BBC is in such a powerful position as a patron, mm. and if it doesn't exercise that power, it's letting it rot. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and the BBC has done that on, on serious music, on classical music, f forever. But they hadn't always done it on that, and they hadn't always done it on folk, and they hadn't all done it on progressive pop either. I mean, uh, we used to think of a thing called uh, the old grey whistle test, mm. which was, we had a little presentation studio that was uh, about a quarter of the size of this place, uh, in which we did the weatherman and the announcers and what they mm. uh, And as we had it unoccupied, we said, why not give it to, to, to little progressive pop groups. So we have the Beatles, Rolling Stones, for, no, for, for nothing at all. Um, and, there was, uh, and also, because I, I was keen on, on folk music, uh, we also had, do you remember Joan Baez? Joan Baez, do people remember Joan Baez? Yeah, yeah yes. exactly. Well, at the time when she was politically uh, not an, acceptable in the United States, we offered her, she came over here on tour, and we put her on television. And of course she was, wow, you know, fantastic, this extraordinarily beautiful girl singing all these plaintive love ballads <laughs> out lying on the floor. But anyway, <laughs> I just thought she was just the greatest thing. And then she went back, and then she made her name internationally. And when she came over for a second tour, for a big, because there's now a big reputation, she refused to appear on any network except BBC Two, <laughs> you see, and came to tell Amazing. me so. Amazing. Yes. The power, the power no, of that was BBC. Nice. Yeah, that, that was nice. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. <laughs> um, and of course, new talent, not just sort of voices that we didn't know, or, or, or indeed sort of talent that we didn't know, but actually you were a real supporter, weren't you, and a real believer that new talent was a real part of what BBC Two's remit yes, would be. Yes, of course. That's um, what you were there for. And, and we wanted new faces all the time, new comedians, new musicians, new thoughts, new writers. Writers, new documentary, and, yeah. and you were Monty Python. You came. Well, up. <laughs> well fair dues. Actually, Paul Fox. Ah. He was on BBC One. I commissioned other things uh, like uh, Not Only but Also and so on. Mm. Should we show a clip? Actually, of this it was a great clip. This is of um, Peter Cook and, and, and Dudley Moore as well, who I believe you gave. Did you give there? Oh, I certainly you gave did. Yeah. First, yeah. Let's show. <laughs> 
<laughs> They're great, aren't they? That was amazing. I mean, did you know that you had comedy bones? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's one thing, isn't it, working in the area that you know about, then following your passions, but comedy is... It's quite a tough one. Well, in those days, you see, we had a head of comedy and a head of life entertainment and a head of drama and a head of documentary mm. and so on. And it was their precise job to know the field. Mm. And there was a remarkable chap called Bill Cotton who eventually became managing director of BBC Television. Mm. But he uh, came from a life entertainment family. His father, Billy Cotton, mm. was a band leader. And Bill Cotton had been an agent and a and a record plugger and all sorts of things, but boy, did he know comedy. And, and he would go around the halls, which they were then and they aren't now, but he would also go around universities and see who were the talents. And he came along and he said, said to me, he said, we've got these slightly dotty pair, you know, <laughs> of, um, and they, oh no, no, by that time they had done Beyond the Fringe, I think, so they knew. And he said, you know, they, they will do a terrific series. Uh, which is what they, uh, and it started actually um, as an, uh, a series that was sold to me as not only Dudley, um, Peter Cook, and then he was going to have a series of guests. And they recorded the first one with Dudley. Ah. And, and Bill came up to me and he said, They two are absolute magic. Mm. I want to change the specification. I don't want it to be different guests each time. We'll have the, the, just the two, not only but also. And that's how it was called it was. that way. And of course, they were just magic, and they were extraordinary. But they, they burned with a fierce flame, but you know, with a fierce flame, it's going to burn out, yeah. which yeah. is what happened. Which is what happened. I mean, I think one thing I noticed about everything you do, David, is that your love of the new and pushing those boundaries and taking risks, whether that's in comedy and just letting those guys go for it on screen live quite often, mm. or whether it's pushing the boundaries of technology. But that's something that you've always kept in you, hasn't it? That you've never got safer. You've well, that's what makes television so interesting. Uh, and, and certainly, if, it, if I bring it back to my own field of natural history, um, I started what um, Life on Earth is in 1970, mm. uh, 79, yes. Um, and, you could say or every two years or every two or, th two or three years, there was going to be some new technical device that would enable you to open a new window in the natural history world that nobody had looked through before. It could be that you suddenly had a, a way of uh, automating uh, tracks and, and zooms in, in slow motion, time lapse. Great, why don't we do plants? You know? So then you've got, I mean, the most recent example, of course, was, was uh, a, a marvellous cameraman director, naturalist, called Martin Dorn, who I've known for years and mm. made films with him for years. And Martin um, uh, came to me, I know he's a genius in, 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 in fiddling around with electronic things. And he desperately wanted to get cameras look more and more sensitive, so lower and lower lights. And eventually he came and said, I can see, I could film now glowworms in a way you've never seen before. And there are lots of other luminous creatures that you've never even shown on television. Mm. So, great. But you always embrace that. And it's, I mean, oh. even, I know uh, during your time on BBC, and we're going to come to the end of that bit soon, but there was a moment, wasn't there, when colour telly had started, literally the kind of uh, actually transmitting in colour. And you were the real pioneer that said to the BBC, come on, we've got to get onto this, because you don't like being left behind. No, well... The, the, the other thing we haven't mentioned about BBC Two was that the function of this third network, as it was, was in, in, in the 50s, um, you had a television that was scanned by lines. Mm. Um, and the electronics was uh, so far developed that you could do 405 lines in the picture. That was it. And, but the engineers had then produced a, 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 a better version that could film... 600, 625 lines, so I increased mm. the definition by 25%. Um, but that required new transmitters and, and new types of television sets and so on, a big shift, technological shift. And the function of BBC Two, one of them, was to, to be transmitting on the new system, the new standards, which would be used for colour. So it wasn't because we were so clever, funny, that we were awarded the job of colour, that was what BBC Two was actually part of the things why it was founded. So uh, I was in control of BBC Two, and after I'd been there for two years, uh, the government suddenly said, uh, we want you to start colour. 
And we said, we've been asking for tart, if we can tart colour for the last 15 years. And we would give one six or nine months. They said, no, no, you've got to do it in six months. Well, that's the way what politicians say. So, of course, you said, fine. Um, and so it was my job to introduce colour. With the, the, probably, it sounds amazing now, but at that time, the number of physical objects that you called colour cameras was limited. There, were only, there weren't more than half a dozen in the country. That it was a big undertaking. Built. They were huge, great things, and they were always breaking down and unreliable and so on. And, they, and no sooner you'd say you'd order one than they'd say, there's a better one available. Mm. Uh, but eventually, uh, uh, it looked as though we had one studio and an outside broadcast unit. And, and I heard, uh, this, is a, this is a nasty story, this, this, is, I, this is a nationalist story. I heard that the Germans <laughs> were actually also producing colour. This is what I was television. getting at, Dave. And that they were going to bring theirs in in, sept in August, I think, mm. August. I thought, we've got to bring it in before. <laughs> and, I mean, we started television, you know, the Americans had got colour, but... We, nobody in Europe had. We must be the first in Europe. And I wondered how on earth we might do this with this limited number of bits of electronic kit. And then I realised that actually if you put three cameras on the centre court in Wimbledon, you could broadcast hours and hours and hours and hours. Mm. Um, and so uh, secretly we changed the launching date and we said it was, Ju I think, July the 1st or July the 3rd or something like that. Anyway, it was the first day at Wimbledon. And that was the first day the British colour television came to Europe. And, and, and Wimbledon's that. lawns looked green for the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. It's bizarre to think that's that right, they were ever anything right. but. And boy, did, make, did the audience make it green. Because at those times, the sets had things called tint on them. And <laughs> that allowed people to vary the amount of colour that was really in the picture. Make it green. And everybody wanted their lawns to be emerald green, <laughs> the sky ultramarine blue, and so on. So they turned it up. However, we don't let them do that anymore. Yeah, no, we do. But, but you, <laughs> you see, you gave people this chance to witness these things in a way that they hadn't. And that colour then led you, wouldn't it, to realise that you wanted to bring art on the screen and that that was a really kind of big moment as well, I think I'm right in saying, as your yes. time as controller of thinking, right, let's harness this. Yeah, yeah. Well, the... Were you going to... Well, shall we, what do you want to talk, what do you talk no, about no, the landmark? No, no, well, mm. no, no, the, the problem was that the first colour uh, transmissions ever were in the States. And it was primitive, they were learning. It was primitive colour technology. And the colours were ghastly. I mean, really awful, and the, and the Americans didn't know what to do with it. It was so bad that they actually stopped colour broadcasts for some time and to mm. re-engineer things. And so colour television had a terrible reputation. And it was the job of BBC Two to, uh, to try and sell it. Well, selling colour was quite a job. Nobody had seen it, and everybody... Uh, there were a lot of intellectuals who were very toffee-nosed about it and said, oh, rubbish, into just ghastly colour. You know, sort of <laughs> so I thought we'd better be the, beat these blokes at their own game. What we will do is to show all the loveliest pictures we can in colour, right from the 14th century onwards, accompanied by appropriate music, so the music, and we will just blow them out of the seats with the beauty and splendour of all the finest things that Western European civilization had produced for the past thousand years. And then they'll have to love it. Well, and if it's any good, we're, we're, it's, it's bold because we could fall flat on yeah. our face. But if it's as good as I honestly believe it's going to be, we'll, we'll really smash them. And, and so we, uh, there's only one person who actually had done it, and that was Kenneth Clark. Um, and he, he, he saw the point immediately, and we had a lunch, and at the end of the lunch, he said yes. 13 parts. Let's show a clip so yeah. we can remind ourselves. <laughs> You'll be glad to hear that, of course, the landmark is still something that I think is quite sort of, you know, only at the BBC do we still refer to what you set up, which was the landmark. And indeed, civilizations, they're now making the series now, um, a, a new series about civilization. But of course, having that enriching people's lives as that mission statement behind BBC Two's. Uh, output, uh, I think, is something that, again, has, you know, so many decades down the line, is still very much uh, what we're there to do. I, I remembered as a boy um, receive, subscribing to a thing called An Outline of History, and it was edited by H.G. Wells, theoretically, anyway. And it was, I think, once a fortnight, maybe once a month, maybe, but it was a periodical anyway. And I was, I suppose, 12 or 14, and I thought, great, 
if I actually get this copy every week and read it, I'm going to understand about history, about how, not, not just English history, but how the world history, which it was set out to do. And I couldn't wait for the next week, you know, for the next issue. And it, that was in my mind when I thought, I really would like people to get up and say, Sundays we have to watch it because it's Rembrandt. Mm. No? Mm. That's a great mission statement. And of course, uh, along the huge line of landmarks, which I say there are many uh, new landmarks that we continue to try and strive for, again, to try and do it differently, but we still try to achieve that. But there was one, wasn't there? There was one landmark that you hadn't managed to achieve um, that really was, a, I think, in your decision-making to go, right, I've done what I've done on BBC Two. Well, that's, that's the case. I, I um, had... Uh, been in administration for eight years, and I really did yearn to go back and make and make um, film programmes again. Uh, and I knew, having got civilization established, I mean these thirteen-part series, that there was the the most powerful, the most riveting, the most beautiful, the most breathtaking series you could possibly make would be about the history of life. What a greater story was that? I was terrified that somebody else was going to think of this for me. <laughs> and I, I had determined after I'd been doing about seven years, I've got to get out of here and I've got to make that series. And, um, and so that's the way it was. I, uh, uh, eventually, uh, nobody else did come up to me. I mean, if they had come to me and said, I want to make the story of life, I'd have had to say yes. I couldn't possibly have not if, uh, if I was the director of programmes. Um, but nobody did, thank goodness. So I then was able to resign and then say, what about a series <laughs> on, on life? And on that moment that you left, David, when you thought, what legacy am I leaving behind for BBC Two is that moment that you have. As you say, it's an extraordinary job, isn't it? Extraordinary position of power. I'm not sure it quite feels like power, but you, do, you were able to influence what stories you tell people. Yes, I, um, but of course things change. Uh, the whole of the uh, whole of the electronic scene has changed. What people can do with their, how they receive it, the way they watch it, all those things have changed. So television has to change at the same time. Maybe nobody wants to look at thirteen parts about on one subject, and it is a big gamble. Mm. And, uh, you know as well as me. Mm. And and uh, so there haven't been thirteen parters. For a long time. But what, what do you most value, do you think, about the BBC's position in all, all of this? And the, you know, what is it that you think, in a way, I suppose, that's important and relevant now as it was to you then? I, th I think that the BBC has an incomparable uh, opportunity, which gives it an incomparable responsibility. Mm. Uh, that it, of all the television organisations in the world, can say we ought to try and cover as wide a spectrum of human interests as we can. And we will recognise that some parts of the spectrum will only get one million and other parts will get five million. But that's got nothing to do... That doesn't mean to say we shouldn't ever do the one million. And that we will measure our success by the width of that spectrum. Nobody else can do that in the world. Mm. We can. Mm. The BBC can. And if you look at uh, what's on television now and you think that's public service broadcasting at its best, could you say now what you think? Because like, as you say, things have to change, things have to move. I think there's still a lot of, a lot of um, subjects which are waiting there to be dealt with, which are not being dealt with. I, 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 it, it's very easy for me to take a high and mighty line and a very toffy nose line about how it was in the BBC and BBC Two. The fact was that when BBC Two started, I had total freedom. Nobody came to me and said, you only got half a million of that for audience. Because the, the, to start with, only a tiny part of the country could see it. Mm. Even when it was two or three year, year, years old, there were still parts of the country that couldn't, couldn't, couldn't even see it. So the f viewing figures meant nothing to me. Mm. And what is more, if in fact, a, a programme was a flop and nobody watched it. Nobody actually talked about it and it just quietly disappeared. <laughs> so it's all, all right for me to say, yes, we did, we did um, civilization and all these wonderful things. I don't tell you about the other things which we did, <laughs> which weren't any good. But that's, that, you, had the, you had the liberty to fail, you know? 
which I think is still that. incredibly important because yeah. creative freedom, we all know, is about having bonkers ideas like let's make a new series all about life on this planet. I oh. mean, that was an enormous idea when you set out to do that. Did you all, when you pitched the idea and did everyone just go, of course, off you go? Yeah. Well, did. yes, more or less. They did. But I mean, the other, <laughs> but, 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 but the other thing, you see, is that the BBC has this four networks, four networks. Mm. Nobody else in the world has that. Mm. And, 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 and if, if the function of those, the editorial policies of those four networks were absolutely clear and the audience knew how to steer its way through it, the world's yours, just there. And I do think that is, isn't it, the role, and I know you agree with me here, that public service broadcasting is to not only introduce people to these different worlds, but sometimes to tell them things they don't want to hear. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm just thinking about the series that you and I have done together, that you did with Anthony Effen about Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. And of course, that's the most glorious, beautiful, magical place to, 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 to witness and to bring the audience to. Yeah. But of course, you were very determined, weren't you, in that series to also tell... The yes, more challenging again, story. because it, the BBC has that sort of responsibility to be serious about what it's talking about. It's almost impossible, isn't it, I think, to, to hear those words and not feel, right, I need to do something. I need to get out and do something. It's so um, motivating, I think, to have someone really say to you, we have to take responsibility. And do you think um, these big natural history landmarks that you've done, in a way, your mission behind them was to get people to care and to understand and to know about it in order for us all to feel it's part of our world? Or is this um, something you've grown to...? I think the fundamental reason that, that I, uh, I make those natural history programmes, and I speak for a lot of people in the natural history unit, is because we are fascinated by the natural world. Mm. Um, and if there was no need for us to say that the world's in danger and go and do something, why we wouldn't... We'd be happy. Mm. Because we don't want to go on about how ghastly things are. But things are in a pretty poor, I mean, a pretty alarming condition. So it would, if we actually think the first, we have to do the second mm. as well. That's part of our responsibility. And uh, uh, the Natural History Unit uh, has a function. It's not just me, it really isn't. I mean, uh, every series I make, you know, is, is 30, 40 people. Mm. They're all people working in the Natural History Unit. Um, and, and it is unique in, in the world. And it is able to say things. And if the world is waking up, not just this country, if the world is waking up to the parlous state of the, of the, of the of this situation, the BBC Natural History can claim some credit for spreading that message around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I look at it and I, I talk to people, and again and again and again people write to me. It's, the, the television programmes that have opened their eyes to what the world is and what it, the dangers that are facing it. And it's a, a powerful responsibility that the Natural History Unit has and the BBC has. Mm. And when you started those big natural history landmarks like Life on Earth, did it feel like that then? Did you know then? Or was it really the beginning no, of a, no, of a I journey? Didn't, I didn't think... I, I wouldn't have said that there was any need at that stage to talk about mm. uh, species loss or, uh, or climatic warm changes or any of those things because we didn't know. We had suspicions. But that's part of the, part of the problems of being in the BBC in, in, in that you... If, if you're a, a national broadcaster like that, you have to be pretty sure that what you're talking about, well, I'm saying this to you, you know this perfectly well, you have to be sure what you're talking about, mm. and you can't, you can't become partisan as an organisation. Mm. You can allow other people to be partisan on your network, mm. but you can't be partisan yourself. Mm. Until the situation becomes so grave, it can no longer be ignored. And it, uh, of picking that particular moment in terms of conservation was an important part of, of my own biography. So when I my own looking at myself, looking back at what I'm doing, did, should I have spoken earlier or later? Did I get about right? Who knows? But, but I know I had to take a stand at some stage or other and persuade the BBC, which didn't need any persuading at that time, mm. that the network, that the programmes we were doing must have that component. They can't be exclusively that. That's, that would be put, the killing... The, uh, the golden, yes, the killing of the golden goose which lays the eggs. I mean, you have to convince people that the natural world is all those things that I said it was and that we are dependent upon it mm. 
and that it's in danger mm. and that we must protect it. I'm going to now show the clip of an extraordinary montage, to, and I know most people have seen most of these programmes, but just to take you from life on Earth to the present day, because it reminds you actually not just of how I think it's affected all of us, but actually you were bringing to light what scientists are out there in the field doing, and you were allowing us to find out and know about it. Because all, I mean, I know you've always said that a lot of what you do is based on the work that so many scientists in the field are doing. And in a way, that body of landmark natural history uh, programming that you've been part of mm. is really, uh, it's a sort of document, isn't it, of what we've discovered about the natural world. So let's show the clip, because it is, it is an extraordinary body of work. I find that incredibly moving. I, I love the fact that you've shown us the life of a small spider in a jungle that we might never have heard of. Never mind the killer whales, never mind the gorilla. I, you know, I think what you've done for us by taking us through all those different subsections of the natural world is shown us things that I don't think any of us could have dreamt of. Now, most people, and you must be proud watching that, but most people who perhaps have done that might think, I'll just kick off my shoes, I'll chill out for a bit, and I'll, you know, only do something if I really want to. But of course, you have been busier. I mean, I'm so lucky. I consider myself so lucky that not only I do this job, but I get to work with David Attenborough, and we get to still make films with you. But, you know, this last year, you've made a couple of fantastic films for us in the Dinosaur film and the Bioluminescence film. Um, and, of course, you're continuing to make... There are more coming to that the line, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, but both of those, for you, were very important, weren't they? Because, of course, the dinosaur film that we made, The Giant Dinosaur, really stemmed from a sort of love of fossils from a young age. So it felt a huge privilege to be able to go, I think we might have found the most amazing, <laughs> enormous fossil for yeah. you, David. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about the making of that film? Because it was, you know, not an easy film to be making. No, and uh, but it's, again, it's the advantage of having a, a, a natural history unit which has worldwide tentacles, and it has uh, a people sitting there thinking about where natural history is going, where zoological science is leading, what are the latest discoveries, and so on. And there was somebody in the unit who s sniffed it in the air, who discovered that there was there was this excavation going on in Patagonia. Uh, and it was likely to be the biggest dinosaur ever discovered. And then following it up and getting up, and I was brought in comparatively later stage. Um, and after the people in the unit had done the research and, had, and up on your level had given it, mm. stamped it and said, yes, that, that, let's go ahead with it. And I was invited to take part. So it was, and, and of course, I was like a shot. I mean, uh, who wouldn't? Uh, so, I mean, I can't believe that I'm as old as I am and that people are still saying, what would you like to make programmes? Um, and uh, I, I, I think it would be ludicrous for me to say I didn't want to do so. I have a ball. I mean, it's the best thing you can possibly do. <laughs> well, it's an inspiration to us all, that, that, that excitement for it. But I guess it's something to do with... I know that when we discover something, you are genuinely... It's just so exciting for you, is it? That personal passion... Yes. Would you say is what drives? Well, I, th I think that um, uh, it, it, some some people speak in certain ways and others don't. And 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 if I speak in a way which makes people want to share what I'm the excitement that I have about something, uh, then I'm very lucky. Uh, I mean, the, the, the people which is, who don't get excited about things, um, maybe inside they feel excited, but but but. Uh, there's so much in the natural world just to thrill you that... that I, I, but I'm the same as, you know, 10,000 others from that point of view. And there wouldn't be the audience for this show if, if the, the audience, whether they're 8 or 80, uh, doesn't matter. I've had... I've opened letters. This is absolutely literally true. I've opened a letter 
from a, a, a sort of boy of eight saying I was fascinated by what the television programme you put on last night, and I saw this animal I hadn't seen before. And the next lecture I opened was from a professor, a fellow of the Royal Society, a very distinguished zoologist, and saying, I saw that last night, it, sh that bird doing certain things which I didn't know they were able to do. Please can you give me facts and figures? I enjoyed it. Now, to have a subject as your job to do a programme on subjects which are equally interested to eight-year-olds as 80-year-olds is a huge privilege, mm. um, and it's just a joy. And, of course, the uh, giant dinosaur film that we did together was, you know... Uh, it got millions of people watching. I think it's one of the highest rating documentaries that we've had in a long time. So, yeah. again, it's amazing, isn't it, that a subject about some yes. could um, come to that many people. I mean, that was... Yeah, except, except... I know you pretended not to care about the viewing figures, and clearly we didn't, <laughs> but I do know that when Mike said... When yep. he phoned you up, you did go, just say that for me once more. <laughs> Because it, it's an amazing thing to think that you've brought people to that story, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it is... It's, but, you know, ask any museum director. He'll tell you, you've only got to put dinosaur on, the, on your bush. No, no, it and wasn't just the word dinosaur. Oh. Come on, come on. <laughs> Let's show a clip of that, and then afterwards we're going to show one of my favourite films, which is the film about bioluminescence. And we're going to oh, put yes. them both together, because they were the latest films that we've done with you. <laughs> I mean... I know both of those films. You had extraordinary filmmakers working with you, didn't you, to make yeah. those films? Well, you yeah. see, there's a cameraman called Martin yeah. Dorn, who's not only a very, very good cameraman, mm. he's a very good biologist, mm. he actually loves insects, mm. uh, and he's also extremely skilled at electronic trickery. And he's been working for years and years and years on getting a camera that would really be able to show light levels, which no electronic camera or film camera until then had been able to do. Um, and, uh, and, he, and he put up the idea, luminous earthworms. <laughs> luminous earthworms? In France? You must be mad. Yeah, but there they are. And I knew that Martin would, would actually produce pictures that would be a spectacular programme, and I'm so glad you thought it was and commissioned it. But, but we've never, ever, have we, been able to see or show people that before, because you never. can sit when you're there and... Never. Chance, and it's, again, I think we take for granted, we say, well, we can show everything, yeah, can't yeah. we? But, of course, this was a really kind of detailed... Okay. And I, you know, I, I, I do think, and I carry this with me, that your openness to new technology, your openness to, I mean, 3D, virtual reality... You love it. And you don't do email or mobile phones. <laughs> um, the, you know, there's a, there's a side to David that goes, no, 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 not that sort of technology. <laughs> but give him some new camera gear or a time-lapse yeah. speed. Mate. You absolutely love it. We are in paradise at the moment for <laughs> natural history filmmaking. There is nothing on this planet now that we cannot see mm. on film, on electronically. We can take cameras to the top of Everest. We can do to the bottom of the deep blue sea. Uh, we can speed things up, we can slow things down, we can see th shots like that which no human beings had ever seen before of, of, uh, of bioluminescence in the bottom of the sea. Uh, there's nothing we can't show. Mm. And if we are tired of doing it, or if we are so blasé as to take it for granted, then that's our fault. Because, by golly, the world out there is a wonderful world, mm. and it's all there for us to tell. And I, I know that everyone will be really pleased to know that we're still doing those lovely singles that you do with you, but actually the big landmark is still a big part of, of what we do at the BBC. And we are lucky enough <clears throat> that you are doing the next landmark series for us, which is uh, Planet Earth 2, the return of Planet Earth. So, um, <laughs> um, so I know you've chosen this clip, David, haven't you? That you've, shall we, do you want to introduce it? Because I haven't seen it. Which one? Chose it. I think this is the Starling. The Starlings. Yeah. The Star. The Starling. The Starling. <laughs> you think you know Starlings? Watch okay. This. Should we show it? <laughs> Can't do that. I mean, and it's poetry, isn't it? I mean, th th that that is poetry. I mean, it's beautifully edited and beautifully cut. But that is poetry because that's not about newfangled um, uh, technology to get us there. That is the most extraordinary display. So, what are they doing? We don't know. Really? <laughs> no, we don't. I mean, there are lots of theories. 
And uh, there are lots of theories about the mechanics and the navigation and why they don't cross. They would why they hit one another and that why they all move in a coordinated way but not quite coordinated. Mm. There are lots of theories, lots of learned papers, lots of mathematical formulae. But we don't know. Love that. I love that. <laughs> so I love I. that. It's a great thing, isn't it, that still we've got so far, but we still don't know. Still what don't there. know. And, and do you want to tell us a bit more about planet Earth? Well, it's... it's um, um, it's, it's, it's a, divided by geographical areas, again. So I, yesterday, I, was just, I just finished a commentary, uh, writing a commentary on, uh, uh, on, on grasslands, mm. and I record it tomorrow. Mm. And some people might say to us, well, we've, we've done planet Earth, but of course, the story the Earth, we can The Earth is a big place, and life is infinitely varied. And, uh, and they're also, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, what is it now since... Uh, since life, life on Earth, 30 years, in 1980, yeah, more than, nearly 40 years, you see. Well, you know, perhaps you could look at a peacock for a second time after 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we understand so much, don't we? Yeah, and we understand animal behavior. We can show it so much better. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, actually, life on Earth wouldn't, wouldn't be too bad if you showed it now. But, but you know... Sure, many of us still... You think. don't get tired of these things. No. No, you don't. Extraordinary sequence. If you had to pick, David, from all of that amazing career, I know people ask you these questions, but what would, it, what would be the one moment where you've probably felt your proudest of...? I think, I suppose, if you were forced me, I would say that life on Earth... Mm. Uh, nobody had done uh, a 13-parter until before civilization, but to do it on the natural history and to cover really the whole thing from amoebae uh, right through to man and from the prehistory right you know, 500 million years ago till today, encapsulated in 13 hours, a coherent way. Uh, nobody had done that before, and, and nobody's tried to do it since. But, and, but it did set um, a pattern for natural history programs, which I'm quite proud of, yeah. No, oh, I, th I think without a doubt it did. I think you've you've inspired us, and it will, it, you know, it will. The legacy of those continues, you know, every year without without a doubt. Um, I know also part of it, though. I, you know, it's part of telling that story. But the places you've been to, and the experiences you've had. I mean, again, you know, even in the last year, you've been diving the deepest anyone has ever gone on the Great Barrier Reef. On the Great Barrier Reef. And you've been to places that very few. Do, 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 did you ever? Do you ever get worried, or do you just have this? Everything will be all right. We are about to go off piste. I just warn you. <laughs> Charlotte Moore. Yeah. I happen to know yeah. that one of your first jobs yeah. in television mm. was to go to a part of New Guinea, mm. which partly virtually no other people had gone to. Yeah. Certainly, no other European <laughs> woman had gone to and who lived with these extraordinary tribes under the most difficult conditions ever. And you <laughs> did it, and I'm delighted to know that you are now in control oh, of BBC Television Programme. Thank you. Getting you back on peace. Because it's, listen, I mean, you know, but, and we do share that sort of love of going to places which are completely unknown. But there is, there is something, isn't there, about that thrill of trying to step in the... And I think that's harder for people now. You know, you can't go to the places that no one's ever been. And I think that's, you know... You did. Well, like, yes, a few years ago now. No. Um, but you're right. But that thrill of doing something that other people haven't, that thrill of... And does that drive you? I mean, you're right, it did drive me. Yeah, I love that. It's, it's great. And, and there are still those places. And there are still those things to do. God forbid that it should be a time when we're so bored with anything there's nothing else new to do. There's lots of new things to do. Those starlings, we have no idea how they do it. It's never been as filmed as beautifully as that. Mm. You know? and, but it's the starlings. You'll see one tomorrow morning. Well, I feel the same, actually, about the bioluminescence film because I think that film, you, a lot of these things are actually on our doorstep. And again, we don't often look around to the things around us. You don't have to go no. to the, the mountains. Of Mind you, we didn't have to go to Rome to do that. <laughs> the fact that they have Quite red tough. wine and, you know, and all those... Uh, <laughs> but they are the best starlings in Rome. I, <laughs> I have never seen starlings like that in this country. But it is a wonderful thing, isn't it, to Come open to your eyes to what's next door. Right. As it, it's not all about the travel, is it? <laughs> it's just about the experience. No. It is. But what, what would your advice be to young... Filmmakers starting out 
What would you say? It has never been easier to make television programs. Mm. Never. Mm. You, there's a, a home, elect, a home video gear that you can get. I mean, admit it costs money, but, but you know everything costs some money. But but you can you can get editing gear, and if you really want to go and you're making uh, sort of things that I've been doing, think to do pick an animal that you can see tomorrow, a pigeon, a rat, a snug, anything, and go and say, I'm going to make a, a, a serious program in which I'm going to have some kind of narrative structure, and so it'll, it may last only four and a half minutes, or it could be last ten, but whatever, it'll have a structure, and it will tell a story, and at the end of it, you'll have learned something about one of these features. Go and do it. And you will discover a lot of things. You'll discover about the animal itself. You'll discover whether you have the temperament to sit there and watch and do it. And whether you have a way of, of actually being able to put pictures in a way to, together, in a way that tells a story. And you may end up, you may end up deciding it isn't what you want to do that because it's slugs are slugs and that's too boring. <laughs> but on the other hand, it could be that you end up with something that you then go to somebody who runs a television company, whether it's a big one or a small independent, and say, look, this is what I can do about slugs. It's only three and a half minutes long, but I think you might enjoy it. Would you give me a job? Mm. I think very, very good advice. I think that sort of go and do it, get out there, don't mm. wait for it to happen because that's what, uh, that's what you have to have to be a filmmaker, I think, mm. isn't it? That passion to get out and do things. Um, well, we're going to wait with bated breath for the, for the planet Earth, too. And I know we were only... Uh, earlier, we were sitting um, outside in the green room, and David was always talking about, was already talking about, so what about next year? I might make... So, so we've already started chatting about what we're going to do next <laughs> and what David's going to do next, and so you'll all be very pleased to say, uh, you know, uh, he's having such a good time that there, there will be more, and that's very exciting. David, it has been an absolute privilege, a pleasure, uh, the most enjoyable afternoon I have had for a long time. <laughs> as much as I love my job, I have to say there is nothing more pleasurable than sitting chatting to you. So thank you very, very much for giving us all so much of your time. You're very kind. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, David. Thank you.